Hi, my name is Dr. Patrick O'Connor, also known as Comicspedia on Reddit, and I'm here today to talk to you about research methods in psychology. Now in psychology we have two very broad categories of research methods. On the one hand we have basic research, which we do to conduct uh, which, I'm sorry, which we use to advance scientific knowledge. With basic research, we essentially have questions we want to answer. They could be about anything, but really it's about advancing scientific knowledge and, and about uh, just kind of uh, developing psychology as a science and, and just having more information that we can uh, point to through research to say this is what we know about people and behavior and emotions and all that. With applied research, these studies are designed to solve practical problems. We see this a lot in research in clinical psychology where research is conducted on, uh, for example, treatments or assessment tools. Essentially, we want to be better at what we do. Uh, who, those of us who practice clinical psychology, we want to be better practitioners and we want to know that what we're doing is, is effective in, uh, in therapy sessions or in uh, any kind of way that we're interacting with our clients. And that's what we see with applied research. However, it doesn't just apply to clinical psychology. When we look at this example, might this be basic or applied research? Think about it for a moment. And as we consider each of the uh, examples here of uh, you know, what's poorly designed or well designed, this is essentially a, a good example of applied research when we want the pilots to feel comfortable in the cockpit and therefore we need to uh, put the instruments in such a, a way and create um, uh, different knobs and everything, kind of uh, shape them in such a way so that the pilot feels that the cockpit is an extension of their physical body, that they can quickly and easily see where things are and can reach things without having to lean and lose sight of crucial uh, uh, readouts of, of instruments. So here a psychologist may come in and say, okay, what can I do, like how can I lend my expertise of people and, and how we interact with things to uh, assist an engineer or uh, any other um, industrial designer in creating a cockpit that a person is going to feel very at home in and feel is a natural extension of, of themselves. When it comes to research, we have some very key guidelines we have to follow when it comes to research design. Now the first one is informed consent. Essentially a participant must know exactly what is going on in the research that they're participating in. They need to know what's expected of them, what's likely to occur, at least a good handful of, of uh, experiences that may occur, what's the general question, the purpose of it, what, what are they looking to answer, and uh, how their roles fits into that bigger picture. Now there are some limitations to this I'll talk about in just a moment, but essentially the, cl the, the participant needs to know if I'm going to sign off on this and say yes I'm giving myself to this study so that I, I, I can participate in it and my results can f be folded into this overall uh, study that person needs to know exactly what's going on. That brings me to the next point, voluntary participation. A, a participant in, in uh, psychological research should understand that what they're doing is completely voluntary and along with that that means that they can leave at any time. If they feel uncomfortable with what's going on in the study, they need to be able to, to back off and say, you know what, this is not for me, I'm very uncomfortable with this and I need to leave. And every participant in psychological research has that right because what they're doing is completely voluntary and that they may uh, leave at any time. Now, my next point I, I alluded to a, uh, just a little bit while ago with uh, restricted use of deception. Now, psych research from a long time ago would use deception pretty instrumentally in, in trying to set up situations where people maybe didn't know what was going on because we really wanted to see how they would react in carefully constructed situations. Uh, there are some examples of that where things kind of go awry. We may cover this in future lectures on social psychology, but uh, for the most part, uh, psychology had gotten to a point, especially with informed consent, we've gotten to the point where deception uh, is rarely used because we really need participants to know how everything they do is voluntary and that they know exactly what they're doing and they can back off at any time. Uh, but when research is essentially um, perhaps instrumental enough to the advancement of knowledge or for solving a practical problem and the researcher can demonstrate that they are doing no harm whatsoever to the participants then deception may be allowed in certain circumstances. Again, compared to decades ago, deception is, is generally rarely used in um, psychological research today.
Debriefing is another important point here that I highlighted where essentially after the, uh, the research is concluded, the uh, participant is debriefed on what they've done. Essentially it's kind of, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do, then you're going to do it, and I'm going to tell you what you've done. There's kind of this moment when uh, a participant may come off in, of the study and say, that was kind of weird, even though you told me what it would be like, I wasn't really expecting what happened, and there needs to be that moment of, okay, well, let's talk about what it was like, what happened, you know, this was perhaps a, con a carefully constructed scenario, this is not real life, this was a laboratory experiment, what have you, kind of allow the, the participant to come down from whatever might have just happened. Um, it's kind of difficult to explain some of this without some examples. At least one example I could think of off the top of my head, um, having worked in a cognitive psychology laboratory briefly in my undergraduate studies that uh, where we um, we had people suited up with these uh, these um, little cameras that were pointing at their eyes and we were watching where the, the they would look essentially the cameras would follow their pupils and, and see how their eyes would scan across an image and in this in these images we would show x-rays of of luggage uh, some of which would have weapons in them. And we wanted to see perhaps how things were organized, whether the, the if there was a knife, was it placed like horizontally or vertically? Was it at an angle? Was it kind of near something else that also looks suspicious? Like how could things be constructed in such a way that we can see people quickly go, go over and can like look at the weapon that we're asking them to search for. Now, I mean, that can be that can be a bit jarring when you know you're told, well, you're going to be looking for weapons and you know fake pictures of luggage. Uh, some people may be doing that for 15 or 20 minutes. They get a little weary about that, and afterwards, maybe they need to, somebody to talk to about that. And that's exactly what debriefing is all about. Kind of being told, you know, these are not real images of of anything. This is stuff that we created in the lab. You know, there's no harm to you or anybody else. Again, is a very important piece in research. Confidentiality, with this point, simply that uh, the participants have a right to confidentiality, that uh, their names are not going to be included in the studies. We don't say, you know, this person uh, did exactly this, and this is how their results, uh, you know, how they performed on the test or anything like that. Um, it's, it's always participant A, participant B, or group A, group B. There's never any indication whatsoever, no identifying information of who uh, that person was that participated in that study. Also, alternative activities is very popular and uh, in some cases required with psychological research that if you want to participate in the research but there's for some reason there is uh, there's something that you morally disagree with, um, oftentimes the lab will actually provide alternate activities and say, you know what, we actually it's we're glad you want to help out with this study we have something else that we'd like for you to do that's kind of related so having something so that uh, people don't feel like that they have to be boxed in that if you want to participate in this research you have to do something very uncomfortable to yourself um, having a, a variety of alternative activities can actually be great for um, allowing people to feel comfortable with participating in research but not doing something specifically that they're uncomfortable with so I want to go over four key research methods and this uh, this lecture. Experimental, descriptive, correlational, and, and biological will be very, very brief at the end. Here we can take a look. I'll leave this up for, for a little bit. Of course, you can pause it and uh, spend a little more time with it. But um, these are the four primary research methods, purposes of each, and some advantages, advantages and disadvantages. And I'll go over some of these just a little bit um, uh, in the next handful of slides. But again, come back to this. I think it's an excellent table if you really want to get to know, uh, a quick re have a quick reference of the four primary research methods. So with experimental research, these are carefully controlled scientific procedures that manipulate variables to determine cause and effect. We set something up and we're looking for A, then B, so that always with A, we will always get B. Uh, you know, if I um, put somebody in, if I have, you know, Pavlov's dog is very famous, if uh, uh, if I associate, if I go into conditioning and I associate the food with the bell, uh, so much so that eventually I can take the food away and that the bell will cause the dog to salivate. And this is something that we do through pairing and conditioning and that the dog will learn to salivate to something that he did not sal salivate to prior. Um, so again, we want to test this experiment that if I manipulate this one piece, uh, can something else come from it? Um, again, that's an example of learning, but at least with um, experimental research, we see uh, quite a bit of that in terms of um, manipulating variables. And now it brings us 
uh, to a couple key points here, independent variables um, and dependent variables. The independent variable is that which is manipulated. The dependent variable is the factor that's measured. Uh, so essentially the dependent variable is um, is that which is, is going to be, we're going to be looking for the change. We are going to change the independent variable. As um, experimenters, as researchers, we are the ones changing the independent variable, but the dependent variable, what exactly, like what's the outcome we want to measure? What are we looking that's going to change because of what we did to the independent variable? Um, so that's the difference between those two terms. Also, the experimental group, they're the group that receives treatment, whereas, uh, or you know, the, uh, the, uh, the fact, the kind of the, the changing factor in the research versus the control group receives no treatment. They don't get anything because we want to be able to demonstrate that with change in the experimental group that, uh, they're, that it's going to be because of that change that they had an, a different outcome, that their dependent variable then was able to change. Um, if, if we give uh, treatment to one group, no treatment to another, but they both have the same outcome, then we know that it's probably not going to be uh, dependent on that that we manipulated, at least the, the factor we manipulated. There's one example, does TV increase aggression? So only an experiment can determine that cause and effect. So on the one hand we have uh, on the far right the control group, uh, perhaps we show them a nonviolent TV program, they get to watch you know mother and daughter hugging and kissing and it's very sweet, a great little family story, and we count how many times does the child uh, punch the bobo doll. On the other hand, on the left side, with the experimental group, let's show them somebody being shot on a TV program. Do they increase, uh, does the child increase the number of times that they punch the bobo doll? And we compare that outcome. We look at that dependent variable and see, because of what we change in the independent variable, did that necessarily lead to a difference in the dependent variable? If so, then we know that there was a cause and effect um, outcome there. Uh, I know this is a controversial study. Having done uh, my own uh, reading on, on video game research and whether violent video games lead to um, increased aggression, that's a very controversial topic. But again, this is simply to uh, illustrate the, the difference between experimental group, control group, as well as independent variable and dependent variable. So we have some issues, though, when it comes to uh, experimental research there are some potential researcher problems in that the experimenter could have their own bias. That when they're looking for a particular result, they're, they have all this money coming in, they have all this pressure of, I need, you know, I'm devoting all this time and work, I'm bringing in grad students and, and undergrad students and people who are all working towards this goal, I need to be able to show that something came of this, that they're kind of, that they're influencing the research results in the direction that they want it to go. So they can say, yes, I had this question of, you know, does A cause B? If the answer is yes, then it was worth all that time and money and effort and getting people all, you know, rallying all the troops and getting all that time that uh, uh, the resources involved. Um, it's, it can be very tempting to some experimenters to find that because, again, uh, there, there could be any number of pressures, uh, both internally and externally, on the experimenter who's designing the study. Also, ethnocentrism can be a pretty major factor in believing that one's culture is typical of all cultures. So you find that very frequently in, um, uh, in univer I shouldn't say all universities, but in some universities, perhaps they don't have a very uh, ethnically diverse uh, student population, and that can often uh, affect then the research that's being conducted by that, that university, especially one that isn't in a, a major city that's maybe hundreds of miles away from the nearest major city, like a, a downstate or upstate or crossover whatever state university, um, you know, in a town of maybe 50,000 people and 30,000 of which are students and they're all, you know, the majority are, are white upper middle class, you know, students. Um, when, when you're looking for participants and you want to be able to draw a conclusion perhaps on a diverse population, it's difficult to do that when the population you're testing is not very diverse. So having that own ethnocentrism essentially of, well, you know, it's, it's all the same anyway. I mean, what's the big deal? I'm sure that all of these white upper middle class students, however they participate in this, uh, this research is going to, I can extrapolate that, uh, those findings out into, you know, every culture all around the world. Um, that's invalid. <laughs> that's not good for, uh, for psych research whatsoever. 
now some potential participant problems, there could be, again, sample bias. I, I alluded to when um, the research participants are unrepresentative of the larger population. So uh, again, when you're not being considerate of who you're drawing upon, that if you don't have a, a essentially a random method of pulling, uh, pulling out a sample, that pulling together a group of people that participate in your research, that can be a major issue as well. With participant bias, this is when participants are influenced by the researcher or the experiment conditions. Perhaps you're sitting in there and you're thinking, well, you know, they probably want me to press this lever around this time. I should probably do this. Instead of just kind of letting things naturally happen, And because as, as researchers, it would be our job to observe however you're affected by, uh, by the research that we're conducting. Uh, you know, if, if there's any kind of undue influence, if you feel like, you know that being watched is changing what you're doing that could be that could be leading to participant bias and that could affect the results of the research that's being conducted now with descriptive research this is when we observe and record behavior without producing uh, causal explanations naturalistic observation is very popular especially in child psychology when essentially we want to observe and record behavior in a natural state or habitat so psychologists may go to a daycare for example see a group of 15 kids all playing together on the playground uh, and they want to be able to track how the boys maybe play differently than girls do they observe the children you know play naturally and say you know draw this conclusion it seems as though boys are playing more aggressively than girls it's not a cause and effect kind of thing it's just saying this seems to be what's going on it seems like the boys spend more time on the monkey bars than the girls or that the girls spend more time playing tag than the boys or or what have you you're just they're simply uh, observing what's going on in front of them without affecting it a survey that's a, uh, assessing a, a sampler population very frequent uh, very common uh, use of finding quick information from a wide variety of people and case study is an in-depth study of a single participant finding out somebody's background and learning ex as much as possible about that one person to produce some research to be able to say look at this one person in their life and how they were influenced by all of these factors in the environment or in their genetics or what have you and we're just describing who this person is and, and how they came to be so here's a question to, to ponder a bit so what is the what is the advantage of studying psychological research methods like uh, naturalistic observation so think about that for a moment why might we do this now, I don't have an answer for you uh, as this is a bit more of a, a reflection question just think about what's the benefit of just watching kids play or watching people behaving in an office setting uh, just going about their business now with correlational research this is when we um, observe or, or measure two or more variables and find relationships between them. This can be confused often with experimental research where we're looking for cause and effect, one to lead to the other. With correlational research, we're looking simply for relationships. And for example, positive correlation, this is when the two variables uh, move in the same direction, either up or down. Um, so for example, um, as, the, uh, as the weather gets hotter, uh, ice cream sales go up. Um, you know, people want to buy more ice cream. As the weather goes down, then, or you know, the the temperature drops, then ice cream sales also go down. That's a positive correlation. When they both follow the same direction, when one goes down, the other goes down. The negative correlation. This is when they move in the opposite direction. So as we increase uh, um, temperature, perhaps in a room, um, we may we may find um, I don't know what may happen in a, room, a hot room. Um, you know, perhaps uh, uh, tr trips to the coffee maker. That's a great one. Um, you know, we increase the temperature in a room, and we find that there's decreased trips to the to the coffee machine because people don't want to drink hot coffee in a in a hot room. But we go to lower the temperature, and maybe we see more of that activity. So as we're raising one thing, the other drops, and just the opposite. As we drop one thing, something else increases. That's a negative correlation. Zero correlation is when it seems like n there's nothing in common whatsoever. We increase one uh, experience and it doesn't seem to have any influence whatsoever. We simply can't find uh, any outcome, any any trend of um, 
people behaving, you know, having more behaviors or having uh, less emotions uh, expressed or, or quality of emotions, what have you. Um, so that was an awesome little slide. So uh, uh, anyway, so with positive correlation, again, you can see as years of education and salary, um, as one goes up, typically it's, I mean, it's not exact, that's what all the dots represent, uh, but that as one increases, so does the other. Um, when it comes to class absences, the more class absences we have, then the lower exam scores we find. Um, so people are, are skipping class more and they're not showing up to, to learn uh, from the professor or being able to kind of challenge their own way of thinking. Uh, they have less opportunity to, uh, to learn more and so therefore their exam scores go down. Lastly, shoe size and intelligence, no correlation whatsoever. You can have big feet, little feet, Medium feet doesn't matter. It's not you're not going to have high intelligence or low intelligence or anything like that, uh, simply because of your shoe size. Completely unrelated. Last research method I want to mention quickly is biological research, and this is when we study the brain and other parts of the nervous system. Uh, this can have any number of of um, applications to research, whether it's for studying medication or uh, or genetics or hereditary uh, issues uh, like diseases or um, other human factors like male pattern baldness and whatnot. Uh, so when we're looking simply at the biology of people, we're not studying necessarily uh, their thoughts or their feelings or anything like that, or uh, or necessarily changes in behavior. It's more that as we affect different parts of our body, of our internal working structure, then do we have other changes in our internal working structure as well. So that concludes today's uh, lecture on research methods in psychology. Hope you found it to be informative and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them in the discussion thread that will be posted shortly, uh, as well as respond to some of each other's questions and, and thoughts about this. And if you have any recommendations about my lecture or anything else going forward, as this is my first one for this course on Reddit, uh, please send me a private message at Comicspedia on Reddit. That's C-O-M-I-C-S-P-E-D-I-A.